please welcome writer, actor, director, Michael Gorgian. So sweet. Oh my goodness. Thank you very much. Oh, thanks for being here, Michael. Um, we, we talked a little bit uh, prior to us being here about the voyeuristic aspect of the film where you, you engage us, you lasso, it, uh, lasso the audience into seeing what your character is seeing. What, it's such a pivotal um, aspect of your film. When did you tap into that idea of that voyeuristic aspect, that dynamic? Um, I think, well, so uh, being Armenian, I, uh, I always, I wanted to make something about my, my heritage and, um, uh, most of the films that have been made really focus on the genocide, which is important. And I think, you know, more should be done about it, but I wanted to try to find a film or a story that um, would be fun to watch <laughs> or would be uh, enjoyable um, because I think, I feel like, especially for Armenians, it's, it's just hard to like constantly be reminded about uh, how much we've been through. And, and um, so finding the right story was not easy and it took me a long time to, I, I thought about it quite a bit um, I visited Armenia for the first time in uh, 2006, and um, I think when I was there, I, I thought, well, if I'm going to make a, any kind of film related to my Armenian heritage, I'd like to make it in the country, uh, make it there. Um, so in thinking about stuff, I, uh, I feel like, you know, the direction I could have gone would be to make like my big fat Armenian wedding or something that was very fun and silly and but hitting you over the head with Armenian. Here's what I, uh, you know, I'm trying to teach you about Armenian culture or whatever. Um, but this concept of uh, voyeurism and using voyeurism, it, uh, I feel like it's a, well, maybe it's a trick or something. It, I wanted the audience to be like Charlie and kind of lean in and and um, be curious about what's going on in the apartment and and uh, just pulling them in. Uh, I, it, it, mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, and it's not a trick yeah. where, you know, great filmmakers like Hitchcock, Polanski use that device yeah. where you lasso the audience into, you know, watching. Yeah, well, that's what cinema is. I mean, we're, you know, being voyeuristic when we're watching movies. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a, I mean, it's a bit meta, but it's, it's, it's what... And you understood that with that device, we're we're discovering Armenian culture, which is the aspect that is so rich about your film, that I'm, I'm, I'm tasting the food, I'm, I'm so curious, like Charlie is, about Armenian culture. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, you know, when I first learned about uh, repatriation, I wrote the script uh, in 2018, mm -hmm. um, and it's when there was a revolution going on in Armenia at the time. Um, a velvet revolution, but uh, I remember following it online and seeing so many young people were going to Armenia uh, because of the revolution. But uh, and with that, I I don't know. I stumbled upon an article about repatriation and um, people going back. Uh, there were different phases, but this one period after World War II, when Stalin invited. Armenians to come back and mm -hmm. promised all these all these things that were you know not true, um, but to me it this idea of I'm going all the I'm gonna you know you had to give up your citizenship. Uh, Armenians came from Europe, from uh, Syria, from the United States, and they brought uh, wealth. They brought 
equipment, they brought automobiles to help their country and going back wanting to like, my, here's my home, my, and showing up and it's not that, it's, it's the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. And um, that just creates such a big tension for then getting just a taste of like what they're there for, what Charlie's there for in the apartment of Armenian culture. It, it feels like it, it helped uh, heighten what I wanted to share, which is uh, Armenian culture and, and music and all these things. You also dealt with something that I just love so much is the fact that art is the conduit um, for, for communication and also the fact that like you can destroy everything about humanity but creativity is something that you cannot do away with and yeah. you, you it was that always something that you wanted to convey in the film to a degree uh, some of it developed later so the uh, Tigran, uh, the, the guard who's in the apartment, um, that's slightly based on a real, so the film is not based on one true story. Um, I dedicated it to my grandfather, uh, the, the beginning, the boy in the box, that's how my grandfather escaped the genocide. Um, but there are m many, many stories that I, in researching about repatriation that are in the film. And one of them, um, one of our producers, uh, Patrick Malkassian, his grandfather-in-law uh, was a repatriate and uh, ended up going to Siberia for painting pictures of churches. So that, um, that story is what kind of inspired uh, the, that character being an artist. And it just kind of fit in naturally. Um, when I wrote the script, the first draft of the script, it really was just from Charlie's point of view uh, about someone longing for their heritage. And uh, But when I went to Armenia, went, went back to scout and start production, a lot of the development of Tigran's story uh, came from going there and meeting Armenians who, so, you know, for those who don't know, uh, most Armenians don't live in the country. The Most Armenians are in the diaspora in Europe and the United States and the Middle East. Uh, there's mm, two million maybe in the country, what's left of Armenia, which is was a Soviet state and now it's an independent country. What I found was, uh, being part of the diaspora, so much of our, uh, what we focused on has been the struggle of being refugees who have uh, uh, survived genocide and are dealing with the trauma of, uh, of that. But what became part of the Soviet Union, that story is something we don't spend much time in the diaspora learning too much about and what they went through is just as uh, pain, they had their culture stripped away um, as many of the Soviet states. You, you're not R Armenian, you're, you're a Soviet citizen. And uh, so for me, the development of that story was, came later and was just as important. Mm -hmm. So, um, but just back to the art, uh, you know, it's a little bit of the, the William Soroyan quote famous William Soren quote about, you know, you can destroy our churches, destroy, uh, do anything you want to Armenians, but when any, whenever any two Armenians meet, a new Armenia is born. And, and that, you know, I feel like uh, that's what Charlie and Tigran have. So. Um, I'm curious about, um, from your vantage point, there's a lot of this film is silent. Uh, there's very little dialogue in the the heart of the film. Was as as an actor, as a director, as a writer, how challenging was it for you to come up with what we see? Where were you questioning the amount of silence? And 
Yeah, I mean, yeah, <laughs> uh, it was definitely scary to do it. Um, I had no idea if it would work, um, but well, I'll tell you. I'll tell you an interesting story that um, originally, so for Tigran and Ruzan, the actress who plays Ruzan. Um, their scenes, when I wrote the script, I had no dialogue written. And Hovik Kushkarian is a Spanish-Armenian actor who came to the country, and uh, Ruzan was played by an Armenian uh, uh, from Hayastan, from Armenia. And when they were rehearsing, they were like, Michael, you know, gonna, what are we gonna... So I wrote an entire script for them that was like a play. Um, and they rehearsed it for, you know, uh, probably about a month. Uh, Hovik grew up speaking Western Armenian. So there's different dialects of Armenian. Um, and they rehearsed it in Western Armenian. And when we were watching a rehearsal, a friend was with me and he said, you know, if anybody hears what they're saying, it, it's not going to work because they would be speaking Eastern. And so they relearned the entire, all their scenes in Eastern Armenian. And I, up until probably a year ago, I had a cut of the film where you actually could really kind of hear what they're saying, and I even subtitled it. Um, I showed the film to Michael Barker. He's a uh, the Sony head of Sony, yeah, Sony Classics, a friend, of, and and gave me wonderful feedback. And one of the things he said, he said, um, "Yeah, I'd be curious." I wonder if you just, with the apartment scenes, if you just got rid of the subtitles and you brought the volume down, you made it so like the audience is like Charlie, where they're just kind of barely, I wonder, I wonder how much the audience would understand. And so I changed, changed it to that, and the film worked way better. But Hovik, the guy who plays Tigram, he's a big guy, he's huge. He never wanted to see the film uh, like on Vimeo. He said, Michael, I see the movie with you in the theater, in the premiere, we sit next to you, we watch. So he had no idea that I cut all of <laughs> his lines. <laughs> and w w we had a premiere in Los Angeles maybe two months ago, and he flew out, and I haven't seen him since we shot. <laughs> and I had to explain to him beforehand, uh, you know, I cut all your li So I, I explained it, and he was like, oh, okay, okay. And then the whole time sitting there next to me, I was like, oh, my God. I could just tell <laughs> he was, but he was fine. He, afterwards, we got on stage, and, you know, I was introducing it. He took the mic, and he told this whole story to the audience. And, but then he said, but it's okay because this is the most important movie I've ever made. So. Oh, so sweet. Yeah. Speaking of, you said about different languages um, and accents, etc. I, I, I don't know the, that languages, but I speak several languages, and I noticed watching your film that there is, there are all these different languages that we're not aware of because we're, you know, we're we don't know them. But but like. They seem so authentic. Like when they sure. when they speak Russian, there's like a different nuance, and the dialogue sounds different. Yeah. Is that is that true? That there's yeah. like different languages, and they're all very authentically handled. Yeah, I mean, we we made a choice to, I, you know, I when I was writing this, it's not easy making an independent film, and you know, I of course consider, oh, maybe I'll do the whole thing in English so that I can get stars and this and that. We ended up doing it, everybody is speaking what they would speak uh, in reality. So the Russians are speaking Russian, the Armenians are speaking R Armenian, but the Armenians, like I said, there's many dialects. So like the prisoners, um, they're speaking more Western, even down to like, um, there's the man in the yard who's constantly talking about Armenians invented this and did that. He's speaking in a specifically Western, like Syrian. He uses some phrases that are very, uh, as if he's from that that region. So, uh, and even just the difference between um, 
the way Armenians speak in front of Russians versus or with Russians uh, and how they speak on their own or uh, we they did a lot of work on the different dialects um, so and I uh, admittedly was oblivious to all of it <laughs> I mean I, I I encouraged it but um, I uh, I I can't tell the difference so um, tell us about the evolution of the character Charlie uh, we're not we're not used to seeing this childlike fool in cinema. You know, it reminds me of Chaplin. Um, you know, wh how did, where, where did it come from? I saw that it was dedicated to your grandfather. I'm right to assume that it may have been inspired by your grandfather. Yeah, very much so. Um, well, yeah, and, and I would say the character is inspired by, by who he was. Um, like I mentioned, he was uh, a survivor of the genocide. And uh, like many, uh, he never spoke about what happened to him. Um, I know it wasn't good. Um, but despite that, he was one of the happiest people I, I knew. He was my memory of, he always encouraged me to make friends and smile and so, I don't know, it just struck me, even just in this sense of Armenians, you know, we've focused so much on the trauma of the genocide, but there's another side to it, which is we're still here. Um, and that is just as important, I think, and uh, to be reminded of the fact that, like, despite it all, there's a there's a spirit that you know people will survive and so in terms of you know the choice of even the choice of the tone of the film um, being slightly comical you know it's a weird blend of it's not straight realism um, I, I feel like the story itself is a bit of a fable and sometimes you have to do that to be able to, the, you know, the concept of a holy fool um, exists in theater and film th uh, here and there. Sometimes we can only see truth about ourselves through a character like that, through someone that is black and white, isn't, isn't quite real. And so I think it made sense to me to have this extreme optimist, um, it, f it felt like the right choice in terms of being able to say what I wanted to say uh, with the film. And you bring up the tone, how, you know, tell us about arriving to the right balance. Yes, there's dark moments and, and then, but all throughout it, there, there is this optimism mm -hmm. and, and lightness combined with darkness. Um, how, how was it easy to arrive to that combination? Uh, no, no. And I, I even, even editing the film, I was like, "Is this work? Did I just make a terrible movie? Did I just <laughs> like I had? I really didn't know if it would work. Uh, I think the music had a lot to do with helping pull it all together. Um, but the choice of the tone a little bit had to do with looking at the Soviet Union and bu the bureaucracy. The um, absurdity. Yeah, it's, that's kind of the only way, felt like it was the only way to deal with it, is it's so absurd that humor, you know, every story from, from Russian friends and Ukrainian friends and Armenian friends who grew up in the Soviet system, it always just seemed humorous how terrible, like how absurd things were. Like you have to sign 15 forms to go to the bathroom. Like, you know, <laughs> I had, <laughs> I had a, a friend, uh, a friend of a cousin's who's a priest was there in the 80s and uh, in, in Armenia, Soviet Armenia, and it's right when they got the uh, metal detectors at the airport. And he told me a story of um, him and a bunch of other priests were leaving to get on the plane and they were like, no, 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 you can't get on the, they were on the tarmac. They said, we have this new thing, you have to go through it 
before you can get on the plane. And they didn't know what to do. They said, don't worry, we're going to bring it. They brought it out onto the tarmac <laughs> and had all the priests go over to go through the metal detector t before they get on the plane. And he was going through it, and he looked over and saw it wasn't even plugged in. <laughs> So, I mean, that kind of <laughs> says everything. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> yeah, I think that was some of my, uh, choosing the tone was a little bit had to do with that. Um, and tell us about, um, did you all along, I mean, you're an actor, Emmy uh, winning actor. Um, did you always intend to, to play Charlie? Was it written for you in mind? I like to tell people no. <laughs> I pretended like I was going to try to get. Uh, we did go out to. We went out to several, several. The whole actors. time you were going like, "Good, fuck him! Uh, yeah. I'm going to take the role." Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I love acting. I really do. Um, it's hard being an actor. It's hard being able to get roles that you, you care about. And so sometimes you have to write them. Mm -hmm. Well, good. Excellent. But the fact that, OK, so now you wrote the piece, you're acting in it, you're directing it, you're putting it all together. Um, insanity, or you're in oh, heaven. Oh, wait, wait, wait. You forgot. And then a pandemic. A pandemic. And we shot in. In Armenia. Yeah, in Armenia in March of 2020. Wow. So. Yeah, and I mentioned uh, Hovik Kuchkarian is Spanish. Uh, I mean, if you remember at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, Madrid was one of the worst. So we had only shot half of his scenes, and he came to me. He was like, "I'm sorry, I I, I have to I have to go. My have a, my mother is there. She's old, and so he left. And then the two Russian actors they went back to Moscow, and then. There was a lot, um, the uh, a travel ban, like there were no planes. But you seem pretty resilient. How did, <laughs> how did you? W I was there for eight months. Uh, my, I, I have family uh, back in San Francisco, and um, yeah, I, I mean, we didn't know if we would be able to finish, would we be able to continue getting. I, yeah, it was, it was pretty crazy. I'm curious. <laughs> Did the isolation that you were going through feed into Charlie's isolation and, and the dynamic of the film? Yeah, yeah. Um, so we went into lockdown and spent two, two and a half months just waiting um, to find out if we would be able to shoot. Um, eventually, the government said, OK, you can on we'll let you shoot just the scenes with you in the cell because it's a few actor or a few people they didn't want a lot of people uh, gathered together so all of my scenes in the cell were the first things that we were able to shoot after being sitting in an apartment for 2 months in a foreign country like no uh definitely the happiest i've ever seen a crew uh it was pure joy to be able to work, to be able to do, just to, to do something. And that uh, definitely helped me as an actor um, to appreciate the fact that I get to get to do this. And your entire crew, other than your DP that was American, like yourself, Everybody is Armenian. You yeah. were in Armenia. Why did you have to shoot in Armenia? Why the importance of having yourself surrounded by an Armenian crew? Um, part of the goal was to help um, the country and help build film there. Since the Soviet Union fell, not much as the kinds of there's not there's not much made in Armenia. So we wanted to help uh, help the country in that regard. I think the story lends itself to being shot there for sure, um, but I, uh, I I think so. We were able to shoot piece by piece, um, and 
the experience of it, we faced a lot of obstacles. And this kind of ties into the theme of the movie. Um, I think all of those obstacles made it a better film. Um, a lot of, not just for me, but everybody involved, like all the ca all the crew, and you know, being stuck in a pandemic, like the the production guys would sneak up to the sets to work on them in the middle of the night, just because they wanted to to be able to do something. So, uh, my cinematographer likes to say, you can f you can you can kind of feel everyone's fingerprints on the movie. There, a lot of people just gave a lot of their heart to to the film. So, yeah. You you alluded you mentioned uh, the music and you know tell us about working with Serge Tankian, and who was involved with the music. It's such a vital part of the film. Yeah, um, Serge uh, produced the film and he worked on s some of the folk music, but he really helped me organize a lot of um, the the well helped me on a lot of levels, but with the music. Um, there's kind of three layers to it. There's the score, and that was done by uh, uh, Armenian composer Andranik Berberian. Uh, the National Philharmonic recorded the score for us. Again, all of these, we never planned, we didn't have a budget to have them do it, um, but people just kept wanting to get involved. So, uh, so there's the score, then there's the folk music in the, mu in the film. Um, there's a tar player. Tar is like a little um, guitar kind of, it's a, a gourd guitar. Uh, Mikhail Voskanian, he's in the, he's, uh, he appears in the apartment with Tigran. Uh, he's a, in Armenia, a very well-known tar player. So he helped organize with Serge all of the folk music. And then there's music that's being played over the loudspeakers, which is, um, so, Stalin had all of the Soviet states in the 20s, 30s, 40s make music that was uh, folk music or music from their country, but that was to honor him. So like in the film, there's a song, uh, Stalin Jan, which means Dear Stalin. And it's about how Stalin is saving the world and doing this. And it's a real song from the 1930s, mm -hmm. sung in Armenian with uh, traditional Armenian instruments about how great Stalin is. So there's that music. There, there's all those layers of music in the film. Wow. And obviously the, the film was chosen by Armenia to represent its country for the Oscars. What, what had, um, has the film been shown in Armenia and what has been the, the reaction there? Oh, they're the most critical. Of course. <laughs> we would never have that refrigerator. We would never. <laughs> no. They, uh, yes, we, sh we premiered it at the Golden Apricot Film Festival, which is their national film festival. Um, and it was very well received. And um, yeah, I, it's difficult because uh, Armenia as an identity, like what is Armenia, or what does it mean to be Armenian? It's a big question mark. I mean, uh, we're all over the place. We have, we're always fighting. We're, all, and we're, it's like the, you know, that scene in the movie where everybody's fighting, and he says, "You want to know what Armenians are? There you go, right there." <laughs> um, but I think we did our best to pull together a, people, both from the diaspora and. Hi, Ar Armenia to work together on this and create something that would uh, would m make Armenians be proud, but also that we could share. I think that's a big, has been a big problem is, is that uh, a lot of the culture, it's, it means a lot to us, but finding uh, stories and ways to make art that is shareable that was one of our goals with this film. And m my goal with the story is, at the core, you know, this really doesn't have to be Armenian. You could tell this story. It could be in a lot of, you know, you could kind of tell it in, in other ways. And that's important because, you know, we got to, even today, a lot of the issues that Armenia has is uh, that we're not seen. 
or people don't people don't really uh, you know what do you know about Armenians you know, oh Kim Kardashian and you know something about genocide in Glendale where guys drive fast cars and like to expand people's understanding of what Armenian culture is or what our history is and you know it's a 5,000 year old culture like it's so deep and uh, I think it's not just Armenian it's human heritage that um, it would be a shame if it it went away um, it's it's a kind of responsibility to help expand people's appreciation of it um, so uh, I think by finding ways to make it more universal and more accessible uh, is important. And we tried to do that. Well, thank you. <laughs> On that note, thank you so much, Michael. What a joy to have you here. Great honor. And thank you. Congratulations on your film. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. And thank you, everybody. Thank you for having me.